This is part two of my home buying journey, which started with my purchase of a two-room HDB flat in 2020 when I was 24 years old. I have an entire in-depth video on how and why I did that, and I will link that video in the description box below. This video will focus on my renovation journey. When I bought the house, I knew that I would have to spend quite a bit of money to make the flat more homely and suitable for my family. So in this video, I'll go through my process of planning the renovation and what the general timeline looked like. And I hope this can give you a sense of your own timeline and what to expect from your renovation journey. Just a quick sales pitch before I start. Everything that I'm talking about today, I have compiled into a Notion template that you can use for your own home buying and renovation journey. This includes the calendars and timelines, the budget sheets, and basically it's a comprehensive database for you to organize and plan everything related to your home buying and renovation project. I will talk more about it at the end of this video, so please stay tuned. As always, I'll have everything that I'm talking about timestamped in the description. If you have any questions, please ask in the comment section below and I'll try to answer them if I can. Okay, let's start. The first most important step, consolidating your finances. Just like in part one of this home buying journey, you have to start with knowing how much money you have and what you're working with. At the end of my home buying journey, I had about $12,000 left in life savings in January 2021, and I had projected this amount months back. I didn't wait until I got my keys to the flat before I started planning for my renovation. I had accounted for this in my budget from the beginning. If you remember from part 1, where I discussed the family conflict that happened regarding the flat that was shared by my late father and my aunt, how my family resolved it was that my aunt would give us $20,000 as a return of my father's share of the mortgage. So that gave me 32 k to work with for renovation, and I rounded it down to 30 k and aimed to spend below that so that I can put aside 2 k for an emergency fund because at that point I had completely wiped out my life savings. The next stage is what I call the research and plan stage. This is where you figure out in broad strokes what you have in mind for your renovation in terms of function and aesthetic. And the very first step is to buy the official floor plan for your exact unit from the HDB website. It's $5, you pay by credit card, and they will mail a soft copy PDF to your email that you can print out. Sometimes the property guru listing will have a floor plan as one of the images, but I recommend you just buy a copy from HDB so that you 100% know that the floor plan is specific to your unit. And the PDF can be printed to scale, which is helpful for space planning so that you can measure out your dimensions to scale. This was my floor plan that I purchased, and I printed multiple copies of it so that I could make notes and draw on it as I planned out various layouts for my home. Next step is to assess the fixtures that are already in the flat pre-renovation. I had taken many pictures when I first saw the flat, and after I had put down the OTP, I requested to go down to the flat again to take even more photos. Here are some photos of my flat when I first saw it. For better or worse, my house did not have a lot of fixtures or built-ins. Even the kitchen was mostly makeshift. It had one of those metal movable sinks, a table to hold a portable gas stove, and only one cabinet fixed on the wall. The bathroom had the default HDB bathroom fixtures. So there wasn't anything that I wanted to keep from the existing fixtures or layout. There wasn't much to keep in the first place. So I knew that I wanted to start from scratch and on a clean slate. With the floor plan in mind, think about your lifestyle, your circumstances, and how the space can fit you. The goal is to know the key functions of your home, and this will differ from person to person and family to family. The next part would make more sense if you have seen the earlier video, but basically I am buying this home for my family, which consists of myself, my mother, and my brother. I knew that I had to fit at least three people in the house, and that means at least three sleeping areas, and also enough storage space to keep all our stuff. Based on my family's lifestyle, I had planned this layout after trying out many different combinations and permutations. My family don't really watch TV, so I knew that we didn't need a traditional living room, and I can convert the living room space into something else. There will be curtain room dividers that will cut the living room and the bedroom in half so that we can all sleep in our separate areas or rooms. My plan was to get a sofa bed so that it can double as the living room couch during the day and my bed at night. 
It was more important that my brother and I each have our private areas to sleep because it was something we never had before. And I checked with my mother if she minds not having her own room and she said she doesn't mind. So the third bed would be a fold-out chair bed from IKEA, which we can rearrange back into a sofa chair during the day. My brother and I would need desk areas because I would be working from home and he will be starting university soon and it will be behind the curtain area too for privacy if we need it. I would convert the storeroom into my closet and the wardrobe in the bedroom would hold my mother's and my brother's clothes. There will be a settee in the living room which doubles as seating and storage. There will be a dining table in the living room as well. I saw this foldable table at IKEA and I knew it would be the perfect dining table for my house. It can collapse completely and has this very slim profile so that I can have it against the wall when it's not in use and just open one side of it for when we need it. But it can still fit up to six people around it when it's fully opened. I've organized dinners with my friends at my house and we all fit comfortably around it. My mother cooks a lot so I needed the kitchen to be very functional with good storage. So yeah, that is how I plan the layout of my home. In an ideal world, this would not have been my first choice, obviously. I wish we all had our own rooms and not just a curtain. I would love a living room and a TV where we can gather together. But this was a challenge, trying to fit a family of three into a flat with only one bedroom. And I think I did pretty well with trying to make the most of the situation. Anyway, the next step. Once you've written down some of your lifestyle requirements, you can start to look around and brainstorm for different styles. I think it's easier to fit style to function than it is to fit function to style, which is why I recommend writing out your requirements first. This is where all the buzzwords and the style descriptions come in. When you hear things like retro, minimalist, industrial, eclectic, these are general broad categories of style. It goes without saying, don't feel pigeonholed by these names and categories. Think of it as a starting point or a guideline, because trying to come up with something super unique from the get-go is also quite difficult and stressful. Pinterest is helpful, but can be quite limited because a lot of the houses don't look like HDB flats. Look at websites like Canvas for Singapore-specific renovation inspiration images. I chose a more minimalist style, frankly because it's the most affordable style compared to something like eclectic or retro, which might have certain fixtures that would cost a lot to do, I chose to work with the bare bones of the space to save on costs, while also making sure that it's still a calm, serene, and aesthetically pleasing place to live in. After I wrote down my requirements for the space and the general style and mood board I wanted to go for, I started sourcing for interior design firms. To backtrack a bit, what does an interior designer do? There are of course the super niche boutique ID firms that charge an exorbitant design fee and they can make your space look like something out of Architectural Digest. But I would say most ID companies are project managers with just as good an understanding of design principles and function. I've heard friends of friends say that they didn't get an ID but they got a contractor, but the contractor liases with other contractors on their behalf. So I don't know what exactly the technical difference is between an ID and the contractor who project manages the entire renovation. My understanding, and the way I'm going to define it is, an ID is the overall project manager of your entire renovation. They will be the one you liaise with 99% of the time. Maybe some contractors also do this, but they don't call themselves an ID for whatever reason. But I'm using the term ID in this capacity. Whereas contractors, on the other hand, do more or less just one specific thing. Like there are contractors who just do painting, some who just do tiles. So anyway, very early on in my home buying journey, I was on the fence at first about whether or not to hire an ID company. But it was after watching this video that I was convinced to just go with an ID. I'll link the video in the description so you can watch it after this. To summarize, I believe that when you're working with an ID, you are leveraging their expertise, context, and time, all of which you may not have if you're not an ID yourself. I firmly believe that the extra bit of money you pay an ID is worth it for these reasons. But if you have a lot of time and a stubborn DIY attitude, you can do whatever you want. I didn't have any of these three things, and so I was very happy to hire someone to do it for me. You may have heard of this website, but I think Canvas is a great place to start if you haven't gotten any recommendations from friends and you don't know a single ID firm. 
There's this quiz that you can do on their website where you key in your budget and your style and Canvas will match you to five ID companies that you can reach out to for a quote. From there, you can meet the IDs in person and discuss your requirements and they'll give you a ballpark quote for the cost of the renovation. It's only a ballpark quote because until they go down for a site visit and assess the actual space, they can only make estimations on the size and they haven't accounted for any peculiarities that might affect the cost of certain works. There are many articles online about how to choose the right ID and all, and I think those articles are very helpful and I highly recommend reading them. If I can give just one small insight, if you're caught between a few IDs with very similar quotes and styles, go with the ID that you vibe with the best because you don't want to be uncomfortable or feel like you can't vibe with the person who is in charge of renovating your home. So after speaking to five or six ID companies, I found that cost-wise, they were more or less the same. The defining difference was how well I got along with the ID and if I felt like they were listening to me and my concerns. My ID ticked all of those boxes and throughout the entire renovation, I always felt like I was in good hands. I'm super happy with her work and I highly recommend her. I'll have her contact in the description below. So anyway, I found my ID shortly after I put down the OTP for the flat. The first meeting was just to get to know her work and her style. Usually IDs won't sign any contract or confirm any designs with you until you submit your resale application. Only after that, then we went into more details about the design and the contract. After I submitted my resale application, I went down to my ID's office again for another consultation and then we decided on paint colours, flooring and tiles, really going into the details of the designs and fixtures. Based on my selection, my ID worked on the 3D mock-up visuals of how my space would look. The furnishings like the bed and the dining table are just for demonstration. The point is to show how the fixed built-in carpentry would look like. So here is the settee in the living room, the wardrobe in the bedroom, the bathroom and the kitchen cabinets. We also went down to the tile shop the week after to look at the tiles in person, which is very useful because you get to see the tiles in real life and feel the texture and everything. And then if you make any changes to the tiles or the floorings, the ID can edit the mock-up as well. The day after I got my keys to the flat, my ID and I went down to the flat for a site visit and that was the first time she saw the place in person. At the same time, she also brought along her electrical guy and then we figured out where I would like to have certain sockets added or moved. This is where your earlier planning would come in useful, especially if you already have a certain layout in mind. Try to imagine where you would want your sockets to be placed, for example like next to your bed or where your study desk would be. For my situation, I knew I wanted a curtain room divider that would cut my living room in half so that I can turn half the living room into my bedroom at night. This meant that the lights in the living room had to be placed off-center to make space for the curtain railing on the ceiling. So my ID and the electrical guy took note of this and made sure to accommodate for that. My final quote, or contract sum, was $23,065. The quote includes flooring and tiling, painting, any built-in carpentry works, plumbing, and installation of fixtures and appliances. When in doubt, just ask your ID on what is covered in your quote. If they're a good ID, they will explain it to you. There are a few things that are generally not included in a renovation quote. Electrical works, which is the wiring, lights, adding or moving sockets. Aircon works, both the aircon unit itself and the installation. The actual appliances like your hob, your hood, your oven. Any fixtures like your sinks, your shower head, your taps furniture like your sofa, and any variations mid-renovation. For example, if you want to make changes to the size of cabinets or add any more built-ins. So my quote excludes the above as well. I'll have a summary of costs later on in the video, which includes how much I spent in total. Next, start making lists of everything that you think you will need. Getting an ID is the biggest step because you're getting a professional project manager to oversee your renovation, and those are the big things like making your cabinet, installing your flooring, painting your walls. So everything that is not covered under your renovation, you need to get yourself and it will help if you have a list of everything you need to get. This is especially important if the things you need to get are things that you need to pass to your ID so that they can install them. For example, your kitchen appliances like your hob, your kitchen sink, a built-in oven, and all your bathroom fixtures like your toilet bowl, your bathroom sink, your shower head. Things like loose furniture and appliances you can get much later, closer to when your renovation is almost complete. 
but if there is anything you need the ID to help you install, you should discuss that with your ID and coordinate the schedules. I actually went down to get my bathroom fixtures with my ID because I wasn't really sure what I needed to get in terms of bathroom fixtures and also kitchen fixtures. Like I didn't know I needed a separate tap for my washing machine, things like that. And she knows what makes a good kitchen sink, what size bathroom cabinet is ideal, and just things like that that I wouldn't know because I'm not a professional home renovator. And then she also coordinated the delivery with the store on my behalf. I only went to get the basic kitchen appliances by myself at Courts, which was my built-in gas hob, a hood, and a built-in oven. And because I got so many things at once, I also got a free microwave from Courts. Just a tip, at some places when you bought buy things, you can sometimes get a good deal or some free gifts. Then I coordinated the delivery of these appliances with my ID. This was more unique for my case, but might also be a helpful tip. I also started a secondhand items wishlist that I shared with all my friends and my social worker. The things on this list were furniture type of items, and also various house tools like basic pots and pans, cutlery, rice cooker, kettle, things like that. Because we had lived in my aunt's house for a decade, we mostly shared these things and when we moved out, we didn't bring much with us in terms of kitchen stuff. My mom had kept some nice plates from our very first home, but it wasn't many. And I am so immensely grateful to everyone who helped me because I got a lot of donations from friends that really helped me out in those first few months. A lot of my stuff are from friends. My washing machine, my kettle, my rice cooker, my cutlery, my dishware. My social worker at the time also helped me find pots and pans from a donation site. And so by the time I moved into my house, we almost had a fully functioning kitchen already. Places like Carousel and Olio were also really helpful. If you look at the free section on Carousel, many people are giving away perfectly functional household things. And you can save a lot of money by taking these items or asking around if anyone has things that they want to get rid of. In summary, here are most of the costs involved in my home renovation. I've rounded up some of the numbers because I don't recall the exact amount I spent. And of course, there were so many things much later that I bought for the home, like home decor and non-essential items. But the costs in this table are for what I consider to be the most essential. For the renovation costs, I had a variation order of an extra $945 due to changes made halfway through the renovation that were not accounted for in the initial quote. Also, usually for renovation costs, you don't pay one lump sum, you pay in installments over the course of the renovation after certain works are completed. I did go over budget, mostly because of my room divider curtains, which I did not budget for at the beginning because I thought I was going to DIY it. But I was continuing to save every month, and I was putting aside a large chunk of my monthly salary towards my renovation fund in order to make these purchases. So my advice is, whatever you think your budget is, make sure you have enough buffer money because things usually end up costing more than you expect even if you try very hard to stay within budget. Some logistical things that are important to take note of. Firstly, when you get your keys after the completion appointment at HDB, you have to figure out how to activate the utilities in your flat under your name and account. This refers to the electricity, water and gas utilities running in your flat. And before renovation starts, you need to have these activated. I believe you can do this online on the SP website. There is a Seedly article that I referred to and I'll link that in the description below. I also have the SP Utilities app on my phone to manage my bills. Also, depending on your choice of kitchen appliance, you might have to pay for city gas to dismantle the old gas pipe and run a new one. I have a gas stove so I had to pay for it and it was $260 in total. My ID was the one who coordinated with city gas but you will be billed for it directly under SP Group. By default, SP Group will be your retailer for electricity, water and gas, but you also have the option of going with a different electricity retailer if you want to. I also organized the installation of my Wi-Fi router on the same day I moved in. I went with MyRepublic because it's the most basic and simple, with good reviews online, and I don't have a TV or landline, so I didn't need all the fancy features that the bigger telecom companies were offering. Alongside the basic fire insurance that is mandatory to get before you even collect your keys, I would highly recommend getting home insurance as well. Fire insurance only covers the basic structure of your flat, but none of the contents of your home. So your furniture, appliances, computer, clothes, none of these will be covered in the event of an accident, like a fire. After a couple months of settling in and estimating the value of all my belongings, I went looking around for a good home insurance plan, 
In the end, I went with NTUC Income and Hans Home Insurance and I paid about $120 for 3 years of coverage. Links are in the description for more information. Remember to update your new address with ICA so that you can get a new address sticker for your IC. Update your banks, utility companies, insurance companies, your school, your workplace, basically anybody that might reach out to you and send you important letters. As for the timeline of how everything went down, I can only share with you a general timeline of my process. Yours will look very different depending on your circumstances. My timeline was also quite drawn out despite being a generally uncomplicated renovation because it was still in the early days of COVID and there were a lot of supply chain disruptions. So I could only move in in April, which was about three months after I got my keys in January. I'll put on screen here a broad list of the major works that happened in the next three months. So on 6th January 2021, I got my keys to the house. Immediately the next day, on 7th January 2021, I had the site visit with my ID and her electrical guy. In February, the main works were the preliminary wiring and electrical works, the flooring and tiling and painting. I was also shopping for kitchen appliances in preparation for the carpentry installation next month. I was also decluttering my things in the house I was currently living in. If I could sell something, I would put it on carousel and channel that money back into my renovation fund. In March, there was the carpentry installation, which for me was mostly the kitchen cabinets, the living room settee, and the built-in wardrobe in the bedroom. I also went shopping for bathroom and kitchen fixtures, and then later in the month, it was the plumbing works, and then they installed all the fixtures. I also started booking my movers and coordinating the days for various installations and deliveries for later in April. In April, there were the final touch-ups for electrical, installing the lights, and then the house was ready for handover, which means the ID finished all the works already and I could move in. I moved in the day after handover with just a light suitcase because my plan was to clean the house and just do one more sweep of the place and wiped down all the cabinets before the movers came in with all my stuff. It wasn't dirty because my ID had organized the cleaning before handover, but I just did a bit of dusting and sanitizing here and there. I also had the Wi-Fi installed and some key furniture pieces delivered. And then the following day, the movers came with the boxes of all my family stuff. I had my friends over to help me unpack, which took the entire afternoon, but we managed to unpack all the boxes. And then in the following days, I had more deliveries come in like my fridge, the installation for my curtains and blinds, and some of furniture like my dining table and the sofa bed. And after that, it was a very delightful process of getting used to the new space, enjoying my new home, finding new things to adorn it, and transforming it into the perfect living space for me and my family. Before I go into the learning points from my renovation journey, I want to share about the Notion template that I've worked on as a companion to this video. Basically, everything that I've talked about so far, I've compiled it into this Notion template that you can use for your own home buying and renovation project. I've adapted this template from the Notion workspace that I built myself and actually used for my own home buying and reno journey back in 2021. I think this template would be most helpful for those buying a HDB resale flat because this is based on my own experience going through that process. But I think most of you would still find it helpful, especially the renovation pages, which can work for your BTO or condo renovation planning as well. I'll show you some of the pages on here. In this research notebook, I've compiled most of the links I mentioned in my previous HDB video and this one as well, plus other articles that I found useful. You can add your own links and articles by using the Notion Web Clipper tool. If you've ever used Evernote or Pocket or Instapaper, it's the same concept of saving articles to your notebook. If you recall from my HDB video, I have a timeline here of all the steps in the HDB resale process and I've included little notes for more information for each step. There's also a finance page for you to do your big budget planning. More relevant to this video is the renovation part. If you look at the moving in timeline, this covers all the main events leading up to moving into your new home. I've based it off my own personal experience, so depending on your situation, you will probably add more things to the list or find some of mine not so relevant to your case. I have an ID page where you can keep track of all the quotes you get from talking to various ID companies. Once you select your ID, it will show up on the main page here with all the contact details. You can also keep track of your payments in this table. 
This furniture and appliance budget was one of my most used pages in this template and this is where I keep track of all my planned and actual expenditure for things outside of the renovation quote. I think it's a pretty comprehensive template if I do say so myself. I'll be selling the template for $5, which is the same price as your HDB floor plan. I worked really hard on it and I, th I really think it'll be helpful, whether as a starting point or a place to compile all your ongoing planning, especially if you're already an enthusiastic Notion user like I am. I'll have it linked in the description box below. To summarize this video, if I had to give advice to friends about what I learned from this entire journey, it will be the following. Firstly, Prioritize function over aesthetic. This is especially useful if you're working with a very small space, which I was and still am. Think first about your lifestyle and whether you will use a certain feature or item. So this is where having a very clear idea of what you need is helpful, so you can work around your key requirements of the space. And sometimes beauty and aesthetic is a function in itself, but consider what other functions you might be sacrificing. For example, I really wanted an open bookcase because I have a lot of books, but I knew from experience that a bookcase like that can look quite cluttered and will also gather so much dust, so I'd rather save the money to put towards something else instead. You may also find that something that is functional is also very aesthetically pleasing. My settee, which is directly under my living room window, looks very good and also serves many functions. It doubles as a sitting space for guests, storage, and also seating for my dining table. At first I was reluctant to get a settee because I was worried it'll take up too much floor space, but it ended up being one of my favourite features in the house. Secondly, let go of the idea of perfection. You will never get the Pinterest house of your dreams, or at least not for very long, because a picture doesn't change. As you live in your space, things get dirty, clutter piles up, and unless you decant all your body soaps and shampoos all the freaking time, you will always have different packaging and logos that interrupt the minimalist aesthetic of your bathroom. Embrace that you live in a house that is yours and don't put so much pressure on yourself to always have it look picture perfect. Just keep your environment neat and clean and that is already a lot to be grateful for. Thirdly, accept that you cannot do everything by yourself. This is related to what I said earlier about going with an ID versus hiring different contractors on your own. You might be tempted to save costs or maybe you have a very independent mindset and you want to believe that nobody can do it better than you can. I was both. But ultimately, I realized that I saved a lot of time and energy by accepting that this is why people hire professionals. A strong example is my curtain room dividers and also my window treatment situation. Up until the very end, I was convinced that I would DIY my own curtain room dividers and blinds using IKEA's curtain rails. Then in the end, I just asked my ID for her contact and I went with a company called Blinds Guru. And as with everyone that my ID had recommended to me so far, they were brilliant. They had all sorts of different materials and options. They listened and they understood completely the requirements I had. They went down on site to do all the measurements and the curtains and blinds were tailored exactly to the dimensions of my space. Looking back, there was no way I could have done a remotely passable job if I had done it myself, especially because the curtain room dividers are such an integral part of the entire layout of the space in order to give it any degree of privacy for the occupants in my home. It was way more expensive than what I had budgeted, but 100% no regrets. Every night since then, when I draw the curtains and the blinds, I'm thankful to my past self for not DIYing it. I'll show you how it looks like in a future home tour video. On that note, the fourth advice I have for you is, don't be cheap. When it comes to the quality of appliances and fixtures, it pays to go with a better quality, which often means more expensive option. I was discussing with my ID on some of the bathroom and kitchen fixtures and naturally, being very budget conscious, I was asking her, can I get my kitchen sink from IKEA? Can I get my bathroom cabinets from IKEA? Because I had looked at the prices online, I had seen the items in person in IKEA and I knew they are so much more affordable compared to other retailers. But my ID really advised me against it based on quality and durability and when we went to get my bathroom fixtures together, I saw her point. Like these are high traffic areas and fixtures that I would use every single day I live in the house. I'm really glad that I took her advice on this. Of course, some things like my shower caddy, my towel hooks and the towel rails I did get from Ikea and Shopee, but these are smaller items. Things like your sinks, taps, cabinets, I think it's worth getting a better quality option. Another thing not to be cheap about is services. You know the saying, 
the only thing more expensive than a good lawyer is a bad lawyer. Likewise, the only thing more expensive than a good mover is a bad mover. Check the moving company's Google reviews, Facebook reviews, whatever you can find online. I had both extremely bad and very good movers. And let me just tell you now that the good movers are worth every single dollar more. If I had to pay $500 more to go with a trusted moving company, I would. The moving company I went with are called Shalom Movers. They will do a site visit to your home and assess how many items you have and then provide you with boxes to pack all of it. From there, they will also give you a quote on how much the move will cost. Overall, it was a very professional and smooth experience and I wish I had hired them from the beginning. Advice number five is to be organized. I personally cannot stand the thought of just winging it and hoping that it will all work out and align perfectly. So if you're like me and being disorganized gives you anxiety, then it's a no-brainer, but also you don't want to accidentally miss important dates and then delay your renovation. So the main things you will want to keep track and be on top of are a calendar to track important dates, your budget sheet, lists of things to get, and any checklists of things to do. If you know your confirmed dates, you can work everything else around those confirmed dates. For example, if you know on which date you are officially moving into your new home, then you can plan your movers in advance. For example, the movers I mentioned in the earlier point, Shalom Movers, they are so good that you can almost never get them to do a last minute job because they would be booked out already. So make sure to plan ahead and book your dates in advance. And also try to align all your deliveries and installation of services so that you don't end up moving into a home with no Wi-Fi or no furniture for too long. You can always buy things in advance, like furniture and appliances, and arrange for them to be delivered later after you've moved in. Not to plug my Notion template again, but this is also why I created it for myself back then, and it's based on my actual experience going through the process of buying my resale flat and renovating it. So if you're too lazy to create the same system for yourself, I highly recommend my Notion template, and it's only $5. Okay, next, it goes without saying that friends are angels from heaven. On moving day, I had boxes filling up half my living room, and I managed to unpack all of them because I had friends who came over to help me with it. Words cannot express how grateful I am to them, and this entire journey would have been impossibly harder if I hadn't had their support and help. And of course, it turned a really stressful situation into something that was fun and lighthearted. So yeah, be nice to your friends and the people in your life, not just so they can help you move in, but because your overall quality of life will just improve. Finally, you will learn so much. It might be a very stressful experience, as it was for me, but just like my home buying journey, I learned so much in such a short span of time. I learned from my ID, I learned from my research, I learned from YouTube, I learned from making mistakes, I learned from the salesperson in courts telling me about the different kinds of hops and hoods. I started the journey knowing absolutely nothing, but now I have so much random information in my head that it's just always going to be useful somehow. Among my friends who are my age, I feel like I have so much useful information to pass down to them when the time comes, and I feel very grateful for that. Even though I made some painful mistakes that I wish I could undo, it makes for valuable advice later on. So embrace the good and the bad, and I think you'll come out the other side a lot wiser and more knowledgeable than you were when you started. That's all I have for you today. I can talk about this for hours and hours because I have so many stories to share, but I hope this is enough to get a general idea of the renovation process and journey. If you enjoyed this video and found it helpful, I hope you can support me by buying my Notion template if you are also looking to buy or renovate your home, or if you have any family members, friends, or colleagues who are looking to renovate their homes anytime soon, please share my video with them. If you have any specific questions, please leave them in the comments below and I'll do my best to answer them. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in my next video.